you have your Bibles, turn them to Romans chapter 13 tonight. Romans chapter 13. I have a ironically fun passage to be in this evening. We'll talk about why a little bit later. But Romans chapter 13 is where we're going to be at. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 7. So I'm going to start reading start verse number 1. And then we'll read through verse 7, and we'll come back and start talking about what's going on here in this passage. And verse number 1, Paul says this, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. If we were to study through scripture, we'll find that God has established three very explicit institutions within our world. The first one that we see established is the home. In Genesis chapter 2, God puts in place the home and, and he sets in an order of authority and leadership within the home. And it's interesting this morning in the, the, Bible, class, the Bible study here in the auditorium during our Sunday school hour, uh, they're finishing up in Colossians chapter 3, moving over into Colossians 4. And there in that passage at the end of 3 going into 4, it begins to talk specifically about husbands loving their wives, or yeah, wives respecting their husbands and, and submitting to them, husbands loving their wives and, and parents uh, uh, showing love and, and not provoking their children to wrath. And so this home is something, this idea of the home is something that's very important to God because he himself has established it all the way back in the book of Genesis. We also see not much later in the book of Genesis that God himself establishes the idea of civil government. And civil government, and whether or not we think of it this way, is an establishment, an organization that has been established by God to function in a specific way within our world. And then finally, in the New Testament, we see that God establishes the church as an organization uh, to carry out his will and when it comes to religious and spiritual things. And in all three of these different established institutions, God has given a specific role for each of them to fulfill. And if I could put it this way, a lane for them to stay in and where in which to carry out that carry out that role. And really, we have to be very careful to not try to overlap the authority structures of those different institutions into ways that they are not intended to be. For instance, we would all readily agree that the government should have no say in the authority structure within our church. We are very much ready to say, I agree to that, I affirm that wholeheartedly as Christians, and that's a good thing because those two institutions and authority structures are separately instituted by God and have separate ways of functioning according to what God put them in place for. And so we're very happy to say, yes, those in governmental authority should not be able to say who can, what we can and cannot do within the church structure itself. But in the same way, when we look at the comparison between the church and the home, the church authority structure does not have a direct uh, application to the home. God has put a structure of authority within the home as well as in the church. And it's a good thing to say, hey, pastors, you don't have any authority within my home. The man, the, the, the wife, the mother, the father carry that before God. And if we can look at it this way, the supreme authority in all of these structures is God alone. And he gives authority to each of those different institutions to be carried out how he has commanded them to be so. And those authority, authorities have their own lane and their own area to stay within. And it should be done that way, and it's a good thing. And here in our passage, Paul is approaching the specific authority structure of government. The governmental authority. It's interesting to look at, well, how does this play into what Paul has been doing? 
If you remember, just a few weeks ago, as we came into Romans chapter 12, Paul began to turn a corner of making a, going from a very heavily doctrinal uh, exposition of the power of the gospel and what the gospel is all about, and that's what we've said that Romans is all about, discovering the power of the gospel, into applying the power of the gospel into our day-to-day lives as Christians. And he says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, that he, he, he begs of us or he beseeches us that we would be not conformed to this world, but instead we would be transformed. And that we would submit ourselves to God, that, that we would offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, which is uh, uh, unto God. And as Paul goes throughout chapter 12, he begins to explain how that looks for us in the relationships that we have around us. And this is a continuation of that thought. You see, consistent um, William Hendrickson and Simon Kissmate. Kistmaker, wow, that's a weird name. I didn't look at that before today. I was reading their, uh, their commentary uh, on, on this passage, and I love how they put it here. They said this, consistent with the starting point, the apostle has indicated what should be the relation of believers to God, Romans 12, 1 and 2, to one another, Romans 12, 3 through 14, and to outsiders, even including enemies, Romans 12, 14 through 21. It is then, or is it then so strange that he now also comments on the proper attitude of believers to the civil authorities? You see, this is a continuation of how believers should act in relationships that we have to ourselves around us, whether it be within the church or to those that would hate us, or in this case, to the civil authorities on which we uh, interact with on a regular basis, the government. It's, it's also important for us to acknowledge that Paul is trying to temper his earlier command and saying, hey, we are not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed. He's saying, you are not a citizen of the earth, you are a citizen of heaven, but does, doesn't mean that you no longer have a responsibility to carry out on this earth. And there is, without a doubt, a danger for us as believers to develop a mindset of, well, as a Christian, I am an exception to the rule. I do not need to care about what civil authorities or about what things of this earth have to do with me because I only live for God and for him alone. And Paul is saying that is not what God is leading us in. And so as Paul comes into this passage, he's going to give us some guidance in this, in this relationship to government authorities. The first thing that he says is this, be subject to the government. Verse number one, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Now this word subject has the idea of to submit. And it's interesting here that Paul uses the word submit instead of the word obey. And I believe that's very intentional here. Um, Another commentary by Donald Hagner and Everett Harrison, they, they explained it this way. What he requires here is submission a term that calls for placing oneself under someone else. Here, and in verse 5, he seems to avoid using the stronger word obey. And the reason is that believers may find it impossible to comply with every demand of the government. A circumstance may arise in which they must choose between obeying God and obeying human authority. We see this later on in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, where the, the, the disciples say, we ought to obey God rather than men. But even then... I love this statement because it's so important for us to remember as as Christians. But even then, they must be submissive to the extent that if their Christian convictions do not permit compliance, they will accept the consequences of their refusal. We have an incredible example of this in the Old Testament, the lives of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And how they said, you know what? Before God, with our conscience clean before him, we cannot submit to this this commandment of authority that goes against what God has explicitly, explicitly told us we should not do. And so therefore, we must not comply. But they also received the punishment as part of the working of God. We're going to talk about this a little more later, so I don't want to get into it too much right now. But Paul says that we ought to submit to the government, submit to these authorities. Why? Why should we do this? Well, because God ordains it. Continued on in verse number one, for there is no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. You see, I I believe what Paul is getting at here at the second half of verse number one is that God is the only one, is the only one who has the ability to give authoritative power. 
Okay, nobody can have power outside of what God has given to them. But here's the thing, God has given government authoritative power within their realm. It is something that has been given to them by God himself. Now, again, like we talked about before, this does not mean blind obedience to every order. We as Christians have a higher authority, and sometimes we have to look at the immediate authority above us and say, you know what? I respect you, I honor you, I I acknowledge the position of authority that you have given to you by God, but in this instance, I must pass your authority to go to one that's greater, and that is God's authority. Because ultimately, he is the authority that is above all. You know, sometimes this has to be done in relationships within the home, too, as well. Because at the end of the day, my, my, my uh, situation of authority does not supersede my wife's authority that she, or my, my wife's uh, being under God's authority. And sometimes my wife has had to do this. She's had to look at me and say, sorry, I'm going to obey God rather than you. And she was right to do so. And in situations, hey, can I, guys, can I let you guys in on a secret? Sometimes pastors, we get it wrong. And sometimes you have to look at a pastor and say, you know what, you got it wrong here, and I'm going to obey God rather than you. Because at the end of the day, God is the ultimate authority. And we know that this is true because Paul clearly outlines that any authority that any person has has been given to them by God as the ultimate authority giver. But like we said before, punishment received for resistance to government execution the punishment that we, can re- that we would receive by resisting, resisting government executing just authority can be, see- be conceived as coming from God. I really could have written that phrase a lot clearer. But look at verse number two. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. As I was thinking about this verse, the word damnation, it, it, it connects to the idea of, of ultimate damnation when it comes to the idea of salvation, of eternal life. But I don't believe what the, Paul is painting, because I know the theology is, Paul is taught throughout the rest of Romans. He's not saying that if we disobey the government, we no longer have salvation and we're going to hell for ultimate damnation, right? But he's connecting it to the idea that we receive damnation and disobedience to government authorities not just from the government authority themselves, but also as an extension of God's punishment. You see, when I disobey a just law of the government, when I say just, I mean a law that is within their scope of authority to give a law, I am not just in danger of receiving punishment from them, but by proxy, the punishment is of God. It is ordained punishment of God because it is ordained ordained authority of God. You see, the idea here is that we obey, we are submissive, excuse me, to government authority because God has ordained it. Hendrickson and Kistmaker, Kistemaker, whatever his name is, who says this, Paul does not, within the compass of these few verses, give us a complete treatise on the respective rights of church and state. He does not give us explicit answers to such questions as, if the government orders to do one thing and God, through his word, tells me to do the opposite, what must I do? And does the moment ever arrive when, because of continued governmental oppression and corruption, the citizens have the right and perhaps even the duty to overthrow such a government and to establish another one in its place? Paul doesn't lay that out here, nor does it get laid out anywhere else in Scripture other than the statement in Acts, we see we ought to obey God rather than men. And these things are not easy to discern. And we'll talk about that a little later on this evening. But but the idea here is that There is a right that government has to be in their role of authority, and there is a responsibility that we have to submit because of God ordaining that authority. The apostle here is referring to the normal and not the outrageous or mistaken government function, as is clear from the next verse. You see, Paul is talking about when government is functioning within its role that God has given them. Obviously, we can see times throughout history, and no doubt, as Paul writes this, in the face of the tyrannical reign of the Roman Empire and its Neros, or excuse me, and its and its Caesars, including ones like Nero, there were situations where the government was unjust. No doubt about it. There were situations where the government did not function in a way that that perfectly coincided with Christian beliefs and values. But look what Paul begins to tell us in verse number three. He says this. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? 
do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he, the government authority, is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. You see, when government is functioning within the realm of authority that God has given, it, given to it, it is something that we ought to look at with reverence, with respect, and with submission. The proper function and authority of government comes from God, and we should rejoice when the government works to punish evil and rejoice when it, or rejoice when the government works to punish evil and reward good. Even when I disagree with the leadership in the government, even when I have a tough time respecting a leader within the government, I still have a responsibility as a Christian to step back and acknowledge that there is a role that the government is fulfilling, that those in those positions of authority are fulfilling, that is within their God-given rights, and they ought to fulfill that, and I ought to rejoice that they do so. Because it's what God put it in place for. The idea we saw in verse number four where Paul talks about the government bearing the sword here is even very likely, as I was reading and studying this, it's very likely a connection to punishment for rebellions or uprisings, for those that would, would put a, a danger on the safety of that state itself. And Paul seems, here it seems that Paul is trying to disconnect the church from the Jewish zealots just like Jesus did. Remember when the Jewish zealots, or when, when Jesus was put in a corner on whether or not he would support the Jewish zealots or those that were, were trying to promote uprisings or rebellions against the Roman rule? Jesus very much disconnected from that and said, this is not what I'm here to do. This is not the kind of kingdom I'm here to promote. I'm here to promote a heavenly kingdom, not an earthly one. And Paul here does the same thing. He, he notices, he, he knows what the Israelites, uh, excuse me, what these Jewish Christians particularly have already faced in the ways of persecution and the temptation that was no doubt in their hearts about the idea of rising up against the Roman emperor, empire and, and breaking out of that bondage. In just a few years, we're going to see Nero and his persecution, not just against Jews, but against Christians as a whole, begin to come up and begin to become uh, more mainstream. And again, these truths are going to be uh, preached to Christians about, hey, we're not here to be a part of those political uprisings as the church. As the church, we have our role and government has its. And let's keep those in its place. You know, honestly, it's hard for me sometimes to take Christians seriously when they complain about unjust governments when so often they also complain and rebel against just and right government leadership. My friends, if, if we can't stand up and rejoice when government does its job that it's been ordained by God to do, and we're going to talk about some of that in a little bit here because it's in the passage, then maybe we ought to stop complaining about that and stop complaining when government doesn't do things justly too. There's a, a famous uh, a Christian apologist, evangelist, creationist. He, he traveled the country trying to promote creationism and, and show arguments for it as opposed to evolution. And that man spent quite a bit of time in jail because it turned out he hadn't paid his taxes in over 30 years. I don't care what that man has to say anymore because he usurped the God-given authority that had been placed over him. He turned Christianity into a joke because he refused to obey God when God said government is here for a reason. You see, Christians, we have a responsibility to hold a good testimony before mankind and how we respond to these kinds of situations. A Christian who breaks the law when it's within the God-ordained right of government to create that law absolutely should pay the penalty for doing so. A Christian who pays a penalty for an unjust law should by faith remember that God is in control and ordains all things for good, Romans 8, 28. You see, so often we get caught up in complaining about government and complaining about the ways that they put laws into place and we like to throw out our little pithy statements like taxation is theft and, and things like that, right? We want to be against the government in so many ways and God says, this is not what I've called you as Christians to do. I've called you to obey the government as an extension of my authority that I have given to them. And that's not a fun thing to say or to do. It sickens me when I hear of churches who have allowed something that is distinctly against the law to go by without real just punishment from the government or allowing that to be played out in the way that it ought to be. 
when churches would hide somebody from governmental authority who has absolutely broken the law and should be punished by that governmental authority. That is not okay. And if you're ever a part of a church that does that, you have a responsibility to go to that church's leadership and call it out. And if they will not be heard, you should find a new church. Full stop. Because that is an absolute breaking of what God has written to us in his word here in Romans, that we ought to obey the establishment of governmental authority when it is placed over us. So Paul says we ought to submit to government because government is ordained by, their authority is ordained by God and because government can and should punish you when we disobey. But then Paul again says in verse number five that we ought to submit to government authority. Verse number five, uh, he says, wherefore ye must needs be subject or be submissive. And he says, not only for wrath's sake, or not only because of wrath, not just because they can punish you, but also for conscience sake. You see, again, Paul reminds us to be in submission to civil authorities, but not just because they can punish us, but our submission to government authorities is a reflection of our submission to God. It's a matter of conscience. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 16, Paul, uh, um, Peter writes this, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for, punish, for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that will with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, and not using your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Paul, or Peter here, he writes that, hey, your liberty in Christ is not to promote uprising, but to be a servant of God. It's not to be a cloak of malicious intent to, to do harm in this world, but to serve others for the gospel's sake. So this is why we submit to government, because it's a matter of conscience before God, because when we submit to government, we submit to God. So Paul says, therefore, in verse number six, pay your taxes. Now, this is why it's ironic that I get to preach this tonight, because guess what tomorrow is? It's tax day. Yeah, fun. Verse number six, for this cause, because you submit to government because for your conscience sake, for this cause, pay ye tribute also, or pay your taxes also. For they are God's ministers, they being the government, are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Now, this one isn't fun, okay? But Jesus himself, when he was trying, again, when the Pharisees tried to corner him about paying taxes, he says, give me a penny. Who's, whose picture, whose image is on this penny? Well, Caesar's. And he said, render therefore to Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God's. Jesus says, hey, my kingdom is not of this world, so don't worry about the riches of this world either. That's Caesar's riches. Let him have them. I'll take care of you with eternal riches. And Paul here, he says, hey, the government, they have civil authority of this world. So allow them to do with that as they will. Pay your taxes, give your tribute, render your custom. That's not what we're here to debate about. We're here for that spiritual kingdom of heaven. And we have far more riches than we could ever imagine in that kingdom. Not riches that we would feel gold and silver rich, but riches of spiritual blessings. You see, taxation, according to both Jesus and Paul, is not an exercise in tyranny or theft, but it's an exercise in God's work within the civil realm, in doing God's work within the civil realm. You see, Paul himself, he says that in collecting taxes, the government is doing what God has ordained them to do. They are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Paul refers to the government as ministers of God. This word ministers here, it's a very explicit term that when we see it used elsewhere in scripture is describing spiritual offices or religious offices. It's the, it's the term uh, liturgos or like liturgy, uh, a liturgical role within the church or within a spiritual realm. 
This is not the same word as like diakonos that would use in other instances to refer to simply someone who's a servant or carrying out a, a service role. God, or Paul explicitly uses language to connect this to the realm of obedience to God and accomplishing God's work. The government does not owe its authority to the people, but to God. Because God established and ordained government and uses government to accomplish his work and his will in the realm of civil affairs. That's just biblical truth. And it's supported all throughout scripture. But it's not just our normal taxes that should be paid. In verse number seven, Paul goes much further than just that statement of pay your taxes. He says, render therefore to all their dues. Give to everybody what they are due. He says, tribute to whom tribute. This idea of tribute, it's taxes, but it's, it's more than just that in our mind. This is likely a reference to the taxes that would be, would needed to be paid to the Roman government. They're oppressors. Paul is telling the Jews, hey, you're under captivity right now, and Rome demands tribute, so pay it. So this isn't even like the Jews' own government that they get to vote in and have a say in. This is, this is a literal tyrannical government. And Paul says, pay your tributes to them. Just do it. He says, custom to whom custom. This idea of custom is, is likely a reference to taxes like tolls or, or import taxation or, or like a duty tax, right? When you, when you bring something, when you, when you get something from a foreign situation, that's the idea of custom. Again, pay, pay your taxes based on the things that you buy and sell. You're just normal everyday uh, commerce. And then he goes on, he says, but also render to those that it's due fear. The word fear here is like when we talk about the fear of God, it's appropriate respect for governing authorities. Appropriate respect for those that are in that position of authority. He says, acknowledge them with respect. Give them the respect that is due to them and honor to whom honor. The word honor has the idea of it, to esteem someone with dignity. Ooh, that one's hard, isn't it? Is the way that you've spoken about those in government leadership honoring? Have you esteemed them with dignity? I'm gonna be honest. When I scroll through my Facebook and I see what a lot of Christians write about government authorities, there is no esteeming with dignity present. There is, there is no respect based on the position that they have been given by God. I, I don't agree <laughs> with a lot of what government authority does in many instances, or says in even more instances, but that does not give me a license to be dishonoring and disrespectful to a position created and ordained by God. God has put these things in place, and Paul says we ought to live with respect towards those positions. We ought to live out our lives in a way that does not diminish our opportunity to spread the gospel in a civil situation when God has put those, those authorities in place. What Paul, I'll read this last quote and we'll, we'll close out. What Paul probably means here in this last verse, verse number seven, is something in, on this order. Simply paying your taxes is not enough. Telling the officials, here's the money and now get out, will never do. You should respect these men for the sake of their office and honor them in view of their faithful devotion to their tax, to their task, excuse me. Remember, they are God's ministers. And by means of what is done with this money is not, not only the people in general, including your, you yourselves, are benefited, but, also, but so is the cause of the gospel. Paul used his Roman citizenship the, the citizenship that he had for a tyrannical government in multiple occasions to further the cause of the gospel. He took advantage of, of his rights as a Roman citizen to accomplish God's work, but he did so with respect and honor to those in those positions of power. My friends, this is not just some easy thing to, to say or to do, right? It's not fun. I'll be very transparent. Uh, we, God has been good this year, and my wife has got, had a lot. My wife teaches private music lessons. She's had a lot of students, and you know what that means? Uh, we file self-employed taxes, which means I have to write that check to the government when tax time comes, and it's, it was bigger this year than it's ever been before. That was not fun. I, I have to see that money go out. I have to write that check and prepare for it, and it, it is not fun. <laughs> 
But God commands me to do justly and pay those taxes. Every once in a while, when when we're doing something, someone will offer to pay us in cash so that way we don't have to report it for our taxes. And I look them dead in the eye and say, I will report every dollar that you give me, whether it's in cash or otherwise, because that's what I'm commanded to do by God. It is the Christian thing to do because it's what the Bible has commanded us to do. My friends, we should not just be afraid of evading our taxes because of the potential of jail, but because it's what God has commanded us to do and our conscience before him requires it. But more than just the illustration Paul gives of taxes, we ought to carry ourselves in relation to the government with as much dignity and respect towards them as we can possibly muster. Not for our sake, but for the sake of the gospel. So that we might find every opportunity to spread it. And when the government rises up and is unjust towards us, just like it happenstance was towards Paul. Paul still utilized that unjust government to spread the gospel. Because Paul himself wrote the words, hey, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his image. Paul knew that God was doing something in and through him that was greater than he could ever imagine. I mean, Jesus himself utilized the unjust actions of government to accomplish his saving grace in our lives. I think you and I can find that opportunity to respond with dignity and with honor as God commands us. So let's live not conformed to this world, but transformed even in our relationship to government. As we break out in a second, I'm going to pray, but uh, I don't think we were able to get the questions printed. After all, something was going on with the printer tonight. So if you have your phone, pull it out real quick. I'm going to talk through our questions for our, our small group time. I'm going to say these real, real slowly uh, so we can get them written down. And the first one is this. What are the reasons Paul gives for obeying government authorities? I don't think they're on the screen either. What are the reasons that Paul gives for obeying government authorities? That was the first question. What are the reasons Paul gives for obeying government authorities? Number two, how can we as Christians develop a better discernment on when to obey and when to possibly disobey government authorities? How can we as Christians develop better discernment on when to obey and when to possibly disobey government authorities? And number three, based on Paul's teachings, how can you personally give better tribute, custom, fear, respect, or honor to those in governmental authority? Again, based on Paul's teachings, how can you personally give better tribute, custom, fear, respect, or honor to those in governmental authority? I'll I'll stick around up here for a little while after if some of you need help getting those written down. Uh, We're going to break up into our small groups. We'll have one in kind of each section of the chairs here. I don't remember who all is supposed to be in leadership tonight. We got a little mixed up. Um, But try to find somebody in each of these sections or a group that gathers in each of these sections to spend some time discussing. Uh, If you're unable to to stick around for our groups, we'll just assume that you're running home to get your taxes paid uh, because you're going to try to apply the sermon real fast tonight. But uh, I hope that it was a blessing to you and I hope we have a good time in the groups just sharing how we can apply this in our lives. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll break up. Father, we thank you tonight for the opportunity to be challenged by your word in a way that we probably don't like in every instance. And Lord, sometimes obeying the government is hard because uh, we don't always agree with every rule they put in place, even when it doesn't go against your word or your commands. But Lord, you have told us clearly that government is ordained, their authority is ordained by you. You've given it to them to rule in civil matters on this earth. And Lord, when we obey government authorities, it's not just for fear of punishment, but it's also to have a clean conscience before you. So Lord, help us to live this out with respect, with dignity, with honor towards them, so that we can better spread the gospel uh, in the situations that we face. Lord, we love you. Pray all these things in your name. Amen.